This is the Living Shorelines for Homeowners webinar brought to you by the Living Shoreline Collaborative, which is a group of local and state organizations that are working together to increase the number of living shorelines in the James River watershed. Tonight, we have several members of the collaborative with us, but it's worth mentioning that there are many more partner organizations working with us on this effort. Um, I also want to acknowledge our fantastic funding partners, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and the Virginia Environmental Endowment. They make so much of the living shoreline work we do possible. Do you mind going to the next slide, Amber? Awesome. Um, before we get started with the webinar, I want to briefly review some Zoom etiquette. Uh, which I'm sure we are all, all too familiar with by now. Um, you all have been automatically muted when you entered the call, um, but we do really wanna hear uh, your thoughts and your questions. So there are a couple of, of ways that you can share those. You can either ask questions via the chat box, uh, which we've been using uh, you know, in the lead up to starting off the webinar. Um, there will also be opportunities to unmute and ask questions at certain points during the presentation. We do ask if you are not actively speaking to please stay on mute just to reduce background noise. Um, our experts will be staying on the line for half an hour after the webinar is over to answer questions. So there'll be plenty of time if you do have questions um, to ask. And once again, we are gonna be recording this, this webinar. Should you go to the next slide? Awesome. So the goals of this evening's webinar are to prepare waterfront homeowners with the knowledge and resources that you need to make decisions about your shoreline. We hope that you come out of this webinar knowing options for managing your shoreline. And if you're interested in taking a next step towards installing a living shoreline, um, you know where to, um, how to go about that. Uh, we'll be starting off the evening with uh, Living Shorelines 101 to give us all a baseline knowledge. And then we'll hear uh, from some property owners who have installed a Living Shoreline project on their own property. Um, and then we'll be talking about the different programs that are out there that can help waterfront homeowners uh, either through advice or funding assistance. Uh, we have a really knowledgeable group of presenters with us here this evening. And I'm gonna let them introduce themselves when they come up to speak, but we have experts from the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, the Shoreline Erosion Advisory Service, the Elizabeth River Project, and the Colonial Soil and Water Conservation District. This group has a huge knowledge base when it comes to installing, <laughs> permitting, and studying living shorelines, as well as assisting property owners with their shorelines. Um, contact information for all of the presenters will be provided um, to uh, everyone who's registered for the webinar uh, through an email after the webinar ends. Uh, we also have several James River Association team members here tonight. My name is Emily Hinson. I'll be uh, moderating the webinar. I manage uh, JRA's Living Shoreline Project and coordinate the Living Shoreline Collaborative. Amber Ellis is behind the scenes managing the PowerPoint and the polls. Um, and Ryan Walsh is going to be speaking later about uh, JRA's cost share pilot program. So Amber, can you start up the first poll? Okay, so a poll should have just showed up on your screen with options to select. We wanna get a sense of where you guys are from. So the poll's asking, where is your shoreline located? Um, maybe on the peninsula, on the north bank of the James, the south bank of the James, um, maybe you're outside of the watershed. So um, also on the slide is the outline of the James River watershed, which is really the area that we're focusing on tonight. I will be talking about the title James River watershed. So I want to be clear, you don't have to be living on the James River itself to be part of the watershed. You could be on a tidal creek that feeds into the um, But if you live outside the watershed, don't log off just yet because there's gonna be a lot of information that applies throughout coastal Virginia. Awesome. So it looks like, let's see, we've got about 75% of people answering. Um, 
Amber, I think we can probably close the poll. Yeah. We've got a good representation from the peninsula and uh, sort of James City, Charles City area. And looks like a couple of people who either maybe um, live outside the watershed or maybe aren't on the water itself. Awesome. All right. So can we go to the next slide? So I'm gonna hand it off now to Karen During, who is gonna give an overview of living shorelines and, uh, and their benefits. Thanks, Emily. Good evening, everyone. As Emily said, my name is Karen During, and I'm a coastal scientist at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, or VIMS. Can you hear me okay, Emily? Yes, I can hear you great. Okay, good. One of the most important factors for successful living shoreline projects are willing property owners who understand what's involved and know what to expect. So this is why we're hosting tonight's webinar specifically focused on the homeowner's perspective. I'm going to give you a, a basic overview. They've only given me about 15 minutes of tidal shoreline erosion and why living shorelines are getting so much attention as a way to reduce shoreline erosion problems. I'll begin with some examples of what tidal shoreline erosion looks like and the range of shoreline stabilization options that are available to reduce erosion where it can't be tolerated. I will show you a few examples of different types of living shoreline projects and briefly explain Virginia's laws, policies, and permits for living shorelines. And then I'll end with a review of the most frequently asked questions. There is a wide variety of tidal shoreline situations because every shoreline has a unique combination of characteristics. The bank height might be very low or a high bluff or some height in between. Wave action or the wave energy of the shoreline might be mostly calm conditions or there may be frequent waves or boat wakes striking the shoreline. The intertidal zone or the area between high and low tides might be relatively wide with a gentle slope or narrow with the water remaining close to the shoreline most of the time. There may be little or no erosion and dense protective vegetation growing on the shoreline, or it could be unstable with exposed soil and active erosion. Another source of variation comes from how the homeowner is using the shoreline. Some people have a relatively natural shoreline condition while other shorelines have been altered by development or defense structures. Not all shoreline erosion looks the same or has the same causes. There may be erosion only at the top of the bank while the bottom or toe of the bank is well vegetated and stable or it's protected by a defense structure. This kind of erosion may be caused by stormwater runoff or rainfall that's flowing downhill over the top of the bank. In other cases, the top of the bank is stable while erosion is happening along the bank toe. This is also called bank toe undercutting because it's caused by the daily rise and fall of tides and sometimes boat wakes. This next example is a classic example of what many people associate with shoreline erosion when the entire bank from top to bottom is unstable with exposed soil, fallen trees, or perhaps even landslides. Another type of marsh or tidal erosion occurs when there's a tidal marsh present. Next slide. If there's a tidal marsh present along the shoreline, it might be protecting the upland bank from erosion, but the marsh itself is eroding. And we call this marsh edge erosion. There may be an erosion scarp along the edge of the marsh on the water side, or there may be clumps of marsh grasses falling off the edge of the marsh. Some shorelines are experiencing erosion even though shoreline defense structures have been installed. This may happen when the original structure wasn't designed properly or was simply overwhelmed by unexpectedly high waves or storm events. 
Timber defense structures don't last forever and erosion may begin when they start to deteriorate, like the example on the right. Erosion problems can also start because of other human actions along the shoreline, such as removing protective bank vegetation or installing hard defense structures that reflect wave energy and cause erosion at the ends of the defense structure on the adjacent shorelines. There is a range of shoreline stabilization options that are available to address these erosion problems. Hard defense structures may be the most appropriate choice for higher energy settings with frequent wave action or working waterfronts. Living shorelines are suitable options for lower energy sheltered settings where living vegetated habitats can provide adequate shoreline protection. This graphic illustrates the general concept for living shoreline approaches. Planting vegetation combined with slope and elevation adjustments can mimic natural living habitats that reduce erosion. Low elevation and unobtrusive structures are used mostly to protect the living habitat features that can intercept and reduce incoming waves and hold the soil in place. The general goals of living shorelines are to change the physical forces that are causing erosion by decreasing the incoming wave energy and slowing down upland runoff flowing downhill. A site-specific habitat foundation is designed to allow for dynamic natural progression of habitat protection over time. This is in contrast to the static nature of hard shoreline structures. Another living shoreline goal is to achieve a net ecological uplift. What this means is to protect the shoreline for the property owner while also having positive impacts on the ecosystem such as improving water quality, removing pollutants, and, and providing fish and wildlife habitat. Now I'd like to show you some living shoreline project examples. This first example is a planted marsh where the wave energy is relatively low and tidal marshes already dominate shorelines in the vicinity. This particular marsh was mowed frequently, so it was stressed and narrow. The Living Shoreline Project included sand fill to raise the elevation and increase the marsh width. The Living Shoreline Project also included new marsh plants added to supplement the natural marsh. Then fiber or core logs were staked together for temporary support of the sand fill and planted area. A line of hay bales on the upland side of the marsh helped reduce upland runoff reaching the project area. Here's the same project site three years later. Notice how the tidal marsh grasses filled in over time and expanded to grow over the logs. These are biodegradable products and they gradually disappear to be replaced by a wide dense tidal marsh that provides the erosion protection. The next living shoreline project example is called a marsh sill. This approach is used where a planted marsh would not persist on its own because the wave action or energy of the location is too great. Stone sills are placed offshore to contain sand fill that's used to create a wide planted tidal marsh and reduce incoming wave energy. Strategic openings within the sill structures allow for fish and wildlife access into and out of the tidal marsh, as well as provide recreation or water access for the property owner, which is an important consideration for many of them. So here's the same project after three years. Again, notice how the original planted foundation has changed into a dense wide tidal marsh that reduces the energy of waves and floodwaters. The marsh plant diversity also increased as new species appeared gradually over time. The stone sills provide reef-like habitat without interrupting the tidal dynamics and access and processes that help reduce erosion and improve water quality. The third project example illustrates a growing interest in combining oyster habitat with living shoreline approaches. The design concept for this approach is similar to stone sills, but it's using li living reef structures instead of stone. There are several different types of reef structures that are being developed for this application, and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation has produced a really useful guide showing some of these. 
And I believe that's going to be on your resource handout that Emily will provide after the webinar. And I even think there's somebody on um, the webinar tonight who has implemented one of these projects and is used as an example in that guide. So in this example, there's interlocking units called oyster castles and they were placed along the created marsh edge to help support sand fill and a planted marsh. And you can see the inset photos of these oyster castles and what one looks like after oysters are growing on it. And in the next slide, here's a project example where oyster castles were installed to help reduce boat wake erosion along a marsh edge. And now we can see rib mussels, oysters, and barnacles growing on these reef features. And hopefully over time, we will see even more coverage of filter feeding shellfish and all the other fish and wildlife that like to um, utilize these reef features for habitat. And expansion of the marsh grass over the bare mud areas because the boat wakes have been reduced and sediment is being trapped in the marsh to raise the elevation. I hope these three examples that I just gave you help you understand how the original design and look of living shorelines is just the beginning of the foundation. The dynamic growth of the habitat features over time is what makes this approach both living and protective in order to reduce erosion. Now I'd like to very briefly review some of the legal aspects, which could be the topic of a whole nother webinar. Living shorelines have been the preferred alternative for tidal shoreline stabilization in Virginia since 2011. A new law became effective in July of this year in 2020 that elevates living shorelines as the first default approach that should be considered. Hard defense structures should be permitted only where the best available science de determines or demonstrates that living shorelines aren't suitable. Implementation of this new legislation is just getting started and related guidelines to help us all with this process are still in the works. Shoreline permits are usually required for living shoreline projects. All shoreline alterations have the potential to cause adverse impacts to people and the environment. So all shoreline manipulations should only take place where they're necessary and the permits are required to help address some of these factors and minimize them. There is an expedited permit process for some living shoreline projects called general permits. This process is intended to reduce the application fees and shorten the length of time it takes to receive a permit. Living shorelines have proven to be effective for multiple benefits, not only for the homeowner by reducing erosion, but also for the coastal ecosystem by protecting and replacing valuable habitats that promote healthy water quality, have productive fisheries and aesthetic beauty that benefits entire coastal communities. So that's why Virginia's policies also include technical and funding assistance for property owners to consider, design, and install more living shoreline projects, which you'll hear more about tonight. There are too many of you on this webinar today to answer everyone's questions in the time we have. So I'll now present the most frequently asked questions we get about living shorelines. First, how long does it take? I've tried to explain why it needs to be a site-specific design and the time it takes depends on that site, the project design and the construction process. There is some patience required for this approach usually because the original planted foundation needs time to become mature and become established. And that takes at least one growing season for tidal marshes and maybe even longer if you're working with a riparian buffer and trees and shrubs. Another question is about maintenance. How much maintenance is required? Once established, like most gardens, the living shoreline projects are mostly self-sustaining and don't require intensive maintenance. Annual removal of excessive tidal debris or the occasional addition of sand fill or new plants might be required. A third question we get often is, can tidal flooding be stopped with living shorelines? The answer is no but living shorelines and the habitats in them are adapted to frequent tidal flooding and they're very resilient. They've proven to be able to bounce back after repeated storms, even severe hurricanes, especially the tidal marsh habitats. Finally, I think the most frequently asked question we get is how much does it cost? And unfortunately, it's very difficult to make cost comparisons 
and there are no good published data on living shoreline project costs for us to share with you tonight. Because of all of the project variation and shoreline variation that I described previously. The construction method, the ease of access to the shoreline, transportation costs, the site preparation and restoration requirements, whether it's volunteer or paid labor, and the availability of materials are all factors that determine how much a project will cost. So I've given you a very brief, somewhat theoretical review of living shorelines. Um, do we have time, Emily, to take any questions now? Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any in the chat box for me? Well, we had one, but it sounds like um, it might have already been answered. Just asking about the cost um, per linear foot of oyster castles specifically. And that's, that's something I don't have personal knowledge for, but um, perhaps those of you who do have direct knowledge with Oyster Castle projects, if you'd be willing to share some specific information about costs in the chat box with everyone, that would be helpful. Um, again, it depends on the linear footage of the project, how much sand fill is involved. Um, just the price for the castles doesn't tell you how much the project will cost. And if you have a question for Karen, um, oh wait, I think we're getting one in the, I have another one for you in the chat box, Karen. Um, if a shoreline is already defended, are any further living shoreline ideas applicable? Absolutely, that's a great question. So even if a shoreline has a defense structure like a bulkhead or a rock revetment, it all depends on what type of space is available where the inner tidal area, where the high and low water lines are in relation to that structure, um, whether or not you could add marsh in front of the structure. Almost always we can do improvements above the structure in the upland area by enhancing and improving the riparian buffer area with trees and shrubs or grasses is a transitional zone between the marsh and the upland. So those are just a few ideas. There are other innovative engineering techniques to build shelves and sort of planting boxes, if you will, on the face of bulkheads. I haven't seen any of those yet implemented here in Virginia, but there are um, applications like that that we're learning about in other coastal states that we'll continue to track. All right, Karen, we have another question. Um, it says, where does the permit process start? The best place to start with a permit process is some of the programs you're going to learn about next in this webinar. I know. Is to help you no. identify where in your location would be the best person to start with, whether that's one of these local technical support programs, a local soil and water conservation district, or your locality government representative, or one of the um, watershed organizations. So uh, you'll learn more about where to start because we always encourage a pre application discussion with the regulatory agencies to review what you're thinking before you get too far along in your project alternative designs and hiring a contractor and putting together a permit application. So we suggest that you start with a pre-application consultation. Okay, we have quite a few questions coming into the chat box so we can try to answer a couple more. Um, this one I can answer is asking if there will be information regarding grasses that thrive at different salinity levels in the email that's following up for the webinar. So I, um, I can include that. Yes, yeah, so on our Living Shorelines website at the, at, um, the VIM Center for Coastal Resources Management, there's a section on plants for living shorelines. And there's some information about the different um, freshwater and saltwater marsh plants that can be used for these projects. And that will be included on your resource handout. And if we can't answer all of your questions live tonight, we will be saving the chat box questions and we'll try to get your questions answered one way or another after the event. If And also we have the uh, half an hour after the webinar hour today that you can also, uh, we can try to answer some of these questions. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to move on and then maybe come back to some of these questions? Because there's yeah. some good ones still to, yeah. still to come. So now, because I, I really, I look forward to uh, what everybody thinks of this next section, because I gave you a very brief, very brief <laughs> theoretical overview of living shorelines. Now we have some video clips with homeowner perspectives. 
These are both homeowners who installed living shorelines with assistance from one of the organizations who you will hear more about tonight. The first one is a homeowner on the Lafayette River in Norfolk who um, worked with the Elizabeth River Project to install a living shoreline. The second perspective is from another property owner on Brewers Creek in Carrollton. And this project was installed with assistance from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and several of the folks on this webinar were part of the second project you'll see. So if you wanna go ahead with the first video, uh, testimonial. Bear with me, my screen's small. There we go, all righty, here we go. Hey guys, I'm Tom Ivey. Um, this is my place back here behind us. Um, Barbara and the, the Elizabeth River Project, we've been together now for two and a half, two and a half years, almost three years. Um, you know, talk a little bit about the project, I guess. It, it was a wonderful project. I actually sent Barbara yesterday some before pictures and after pictures. Uh, when I first looked at this property, I couldn't, I didn't have, a, I, I've got good vision, I feel like, but I didn't have enough vision to be able to see for it to turn out like it did now. Um, it was, there was cinder block, there was roadway, there were tires. I mean, everything imaginable had just been thrown. It was a, it was a junkyard. I mean, it really truly was. Uh, these guys came in, uh, they cleaned it up, they they, you know, helped support me and I was clueless. I never, I've never lived on the river before. And I don't know what made me want to live on the river, but I finally decided I want to live on the river. But they came in and, and really walked me through everything. I mean, from the permitting process uh, to help me find a, a, a person that could, you know, help arrange to, to the permits for the, for the pier, for the, for the floating dock. Um, they've been there every step of the way. And for me, not being an environmentalist, uh, but enjoying wildlife, enjoying hunting and fishing, obviously, you know, for me, it was about bringing the water quality back. For a homeowner, it was a blessing. I mean, it really and truly was. I couldn't have done it on my own. There's no way I could have had the vision that these guys have had, the monetary support out of it, but they didn't have to persuade me to do this. I would have been more than happy to do this, you know, with it because it has been such a good project. Yeah. Go back and show. Did you lose anything? I lost the whole thing now. Well, we have to leave in 15 minutes anyway, right? Go back and hit your power thing again. Mm -hmm. See, I don't have Surrey. What do you no, it's not yet. Google. All right. And just a reminder, if you're not muted, just to mute, there's a little bit of background noise. All right. And Karen, are you still there? Do you want to introduce the next one while I pull it up? Sure. The second one is um, a project, as I said, in Carrollton, which is in Isle of Wight County. And this was a uh, project that was funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and that some of the James River Association staff actually contributed labor to help build. And Ryan Walsh um, helped sort of track this project and help produce this video. All right, can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Walsh. I'm the Lower James Restoration Coordinator for the James River Association. And uh, first of all, here's the marsh that's directly across Brewers Creek from the project site. Uh, you can see that it's expansive, it's large, it's really lush, and it's extremely healthy. And uh, this is what uh, basically used to be yeah. in the homeowner's yard. But unfortunately, they're experiencing uh, erosion about six inches per year. And you can see the undercut bank right here, uh, rising and falling tides, as well as boat weight contributed to a loss of sediment here. All right, so first the contractor put in a coconut fiber core log, and that's to hold in sand. 
And then they built this flume going through uh, the homeowner's backyard to gradually add sand one wheel there at a time. And it was graded to match the elevation of the marsh that's adjacent to it. You can see it on the right between where the contractor is shoveling and the pier. And the sand is at a certain grade. You don't want it too fine and you don't want it too coarse either. It's uh, specifically designed for the plants to grow well in it. All right. Oh, here's a couple days later, uh, they're adding more sand. Uh, it had to settle for a couple weeks and then uh, they came back to add more. So you can see the project's fine. Uh, they didn't really lose much in between uh, when they first started and then letting it settle for a couple weeks. They eventually added oyster shell bags in front of the coconut fiber core logs and that's to provide uh, protection of the marsh toe as well as to create habitat over time. And then JRA staff helped uh, plant Spartina alterniflora or smooth cord grass plugs. I believe there's between four and 600 of them planted in this area. And lastly, uh, goose exclusion fencing is put up and that's to deter Canada geese from landing in the project site and eating the new plants. So here before you can really see the undercut bank and how they are losing trees over time. And so it was important to them to, uh, to really save this uh, part of their property. And here it is afterwards, after the planting. And this is the most recent picture. This is actually taken just a couple weeks ago. All right, thank you very much. Ryan, do you have any impressions from the property owner about uh, what their thoughts are about their project? I do, I actually chatted with him uh, pretty recently and um, I'll, I'll distill, it was about a five or six minute conversation, so I'll distill it down. But he said they were originally losing about five or six inches of shoreline per year and he was you know, going out and marking it. They're losing trees into the Tidal Creek itself. Um, he said they actually were initially interested in building a living shoreline to stop it. And they were a little worried about um, applying for a permit and maybe not getting it. They weren't really sure where to go. Um, DCRCs, uh, the Shoreline Erosion Advisory Service uh, within the Department of Conservation and Recreation conducted a site visit. And that's how uh, we, the James River Association, eventually found out about them. So we had a grant uh, in Prince George, Surrey, and Isle of Wight counties to build three demonstration living shorelines projects. So we were able to go out there. Uh, we were able to build them a living shoreline, um, work through the whole uh, process of creating a landowner contract um, to keep the shoreline in place for 10 years. And he's very pleased with how it turned out. Uh, the shoreline itself survived Tropical Storm Isa Eos, as well as two uh, six inch rain events. He's gone out there and I think after the tropical storm, his next door neighbor lost five trees and there's only one grass plug that was sitting on top of the sand. So he went in a little hole, stuck the grass back in and it's fine. Um, since then, the grass is growing and after a complete growing season under its belt, I'm sure that the shoreline's gonna look very good. Would you like me to pick out some of the questions from the chat box, Emily? Yeah, I was just I was just about to go there. We also have some folks who are raising their hands. So um, if you're raising your hand because you have a question, you can go ahead and unmute and, and ask now.
right. If not, there are some really great, oh, yeah, I see Norman. You're muted. Hey. Look like crap. <laughs> and that's Thomas. Yeah. Thomas, uh, did you have a question or Norman? Yes. Uh, who has the uh, legal ownership of the land that the living shoreline is on? Do you have to own it or is it in the public uh, uh, river way? This particular one is on private property. The other two living shorelines we're doing within this grant are both on public property. So that's uh, probably outlined in the permit, I imagine. Correct, yes. Okay. And uh, usually a property owner owns down to the low water mark, I believe. Um, so most of that. Uh, I wanted to comment that I've, I've just built a 160 foot long living shoreline on the eastern shore on the bay side up uh, on Craddock Creek up by Exmoor. And uh, it's, it's worked out really well. I, one, the, one thing I'd like to add, uh, my experience, one, one part of the experience was um, the state government through uh, VCAP, Virginia Conservation Assistance Program, will uh, pay up to 75% of a living shoreline construction up to $15,000, which my project ended up costing about 23,000. So I got the whole thing built for $8,000. And I used the oyster castle method. Um, and I, actually I had some questions to, to some of you knowledgeable people here about whether, where, where would you put your oysters on your oyster castle? Would you put them on, uh, what I have them now is I have them at the inlets where there's you know, there's a mandated uh, 10 foot opening along the 160 feet. And I, I mounted oysters. I had about 10,000 oysters given to me by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and mounted them around the openings because of uh, the flow going in and out rather than putting them all on the outside or all on the inside or whatever. But opinions about that, I'd love to, to hear. We don't really have current design guidelines or um, standards for how to build or place oysters related to these. Pro really what we're doing now is we're tracking projects like yours to see what seems to work best. And there's been various approaches with oyster castles, um, setting um, spat set on them before they're deployed, not putting anything on them at all, doing what you're doing, sort of putting live oysters out around them and letting those oysters spawn for spat set to create the reef. So there's various approaches that are currently under investigation and scientific study. And then we will hope to have some more specific guidance for you. So it'll be very interesting to see right. what works on your project and if you can help us monitor what happens with parts of I, your project. I'd love to, love to. And if, if uh, you know somebody interested in seeing it, Coming out here, I'm, I'm getting people together just to dig, see what, what we built and uh, how, how it's working. It looks pretty good right now. Um, there was a question about the grazing exclusion materials. Can I, can I um, answer that question, Emily? Yes, please do. So in some of the photos and video, you might have seen um, an array of strings and stakes and flags sort of crisscrossing over the planted marsh area. And I did not mention that during my talk, but what that is is called grazing exclusion to keep animals that eat the plants out until the plants become well established, the roots start growing, and the animals are no longer able to pull the plants easily out of the ground. Primarily in our area, we're dealing with Canada geese and they will destroy a living shoreline project in a very short period of time by eating all of the new plants. So those uh, materials are necessary in most locations for temporarily, just for a little while for the first growing season until the plants become established and then they can be removed. Um, other times we need to keep people out. We need to limit foot traffic if it's a public site um, and we'll use similar types of fencing or other protective measures to give the plants a little head start and protection so that they can become established. So I, I did want to, to comment on that because I failed to in my talk. Hey, Karen. Yeah. Um, I just got a really great question. It was sent to just me, but I think it's a good one for the whole group. Um, so it asks that, you know, most of what we're talking about is the shoreline, but what do you need to do for further inshore 
so I guess upland, to diminish runoff? Great question. And I think everybody has an opportunity to look at their shoreline from where their house is all the way down to the waterline and look at opportunities. Where, where is your rainfall flowing? Do you have gutters on your house or using rain barrels? Do you have hard driveways and decks and patios and even stairs down to the water can all be hard surfaces that can create runoff that contributes to erosion. And so understanding how the water is flowing off your property toward the shoreline is the first step. And then the next step, what can you do to intercept and slow down that runoff, preferably with vegetation? Can you do some more plantings? Can you maybe install low swales I've seen used effectively um, to help sort of slow down and help increase infiltration or uh, putting the water into the ground, letting it slowly filter into the ground instead of running fast over the surface down to the shoreline? Um, we have a time for, I think, a couple more questions. Um, are there any contractors who specialize in putting in a living shoreline? There are contractors who specialize in this approach, but there's also contractors who provide a variety of services, including living shorelines and other uh, shoreline stabilization techniques. And another frequently asked question, I, I only had so much time and room on my slide, but this is the other frequently asked question we have, is, is there a list of contractors that we can call another living shoreline professionals? And we, we really don't have that at it readily available in Virginia, but we do have an organization called the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professionals, and they are certified and there's a directory of those professionals um, and they are trained to recognize opportunities and also how to design not only um, the living shoreline type approaches, but stormwater management best practices, conservation landscaping using native plants and other techniques. So there, there is a directory for some landscape professionals, but not really just yet for marine contractors. Um, but I think you'll learn as we share more information and network together, we'll learn more about who's installing these projects and learn more about the demonstration projects and who's doing the work. Um, I have, I think maybe one more question I saw in the chat box before we move on to the, to the next one. It says, um, uh, are freshwater shorelines going to be addressed? There absolutely can, you can apply for uh, living shorelines to freshwater shorelines. If, if you mean freshwater is non-tidal, um, you know, like lakes and rivers and reservoirs and stormwater ponds, if, if that's what you mean, there, there are similar approaches. And there's actually um, other techniques that can be used because they're not subject to the same forces of tides and coastal storms and waves that we see along our tidal shorelines. So there's some products that are being used that encourage um, the use of so these fancy sandbags and geotextile materials that allow plants to grow in them along lake and pond shorelines. So the, the techniques are similar um, and, and the approach is the same, but it's, we're just sort of featuring the tidal shorelines because they are a unique situation tonight. Awesome. Well, um, yeah, I think we're gonna we're gonna move on for now. But thank you, everybody who's asking questions. Um, we we really encourage that, and we'll definitely have time to get to the rest of these um, in a little bit. So, Amber, can you pull back up the? Actually, I guess the poll doesn't need to be a pre it doesn't need that presentation. Oh yeah, yep. I was gonna share my screen though to start. Um, to pull that back up, and then I can launch the poll. <clears throat> there you go. Great. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, thank you guys so much, Karen. You managed to pack a lot of information into a short period of time. Um, so we want to hear from you, you know, how concerned you are about shoreline erosion on your property. So just kind of ranking from, you know, very concerned to not at all worried. Um, and that there can be so many things that can influence this answer. You know, how much erosion you're seeing, what um, body of water your, your shoreline is located on, maybe how close your home is to the shoreline, or if you have a pier or a dock along the shoreline. Yep. Give you guys a couple more, a little bit more time to answer. All right. 
I think we can probably close it. Yeah. Well, that, that kind of makes sense, right? If you're joining our webinar tonight about controlling erosion, you probably have uh, some concern. That's what most, that was the most popular answer. Um, so yeah, that, that's interesting. We can, um, we can move on to the next slide. Okay. So, you know, we've been getting a couple of questions about this, uh, which is great. So there are several programs in the Lower James Watershed that um, provide assistance to property owners. So some of these programs apply to all of Virginia, while others only um, apply to specific watersheds or counties or cities. So there are four programs that we'll be talking about today. And uh, you, know, you can take notes if you'd like, but I will be sending out all of this information like um, contact emails and websites about these programs after the webinar. So we're gonna kick it off with um, Aaron Wendt from the Shoreline Erosion Advisory Service. Aaron. Thanks, Emily, can you hear me? I can. Great, howdy and good evening. I'm Aaron Wendt with the Shoreline Erosion Advisory Service or SEAS, which is a program of the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation. The Virginia General Assembly established SEAS in 1980 as a resource for shoreline landowners and communities. So for over 40 years, SEAS has provided free unbiased technical assistance to private property owners experiencing tidal shoreline erosion, including both residential and agricultural properties. We also examine erosion issues on non-tidal stream banks and impoundments. Additionally, we assist localities and state and federal agencies with their shoreline management issues. Uh, some of the services uh, provided by SEAS include on-site field investigations of your erosion concerns, written advisory reports with recommended solutions, resource materials, and lists of contractors. We also can do design and plan reviews to help strengthen your permit application, construction inspections, and we can provide guidance on available financial incentive programs. And perhaps best of all, all of these SEAS services are provided at no cost individual property owner. Um, I want to mention just a few of the financial incentives available to help property owners with the costs of installing living shorelines. There are cost share grants for residential property. There's potential property tax exemptions for living shorelines. There's also the potential for low interest loans for residential, business, or public properties. And for agricultural properties, there's cost share, low interest loans, and refundable tax credits available for living shorelines. The next three speakers will discuss some of these uh, financial incentive programs in, uh, in more detail. Um, so please give me a call, send me an email, or take a look at our website if you're interested in scheduling a free site visit so we can discuss your shoreline erosion concerns at your property. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass the presentation off to our next speaker, Robin, with the Colonial Soil and Water Conservation District. All right, thanks, Erin. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Robin Goad, and I work for the Colonial Soil and Water Conservation District um, located in Williamsburg. So I manage the Virginia Conservation Assistance Program, which I'm going to refer to as VCAP for the Colonial District, and I'm going to share some very brief details about the program with you. Um, VCAP is a statewide program led by the Virginia Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts, and it's administered locally by individual conservation districts. The goal of the program is to provide technical and financial assistance to landowners who install an eligible best management practice, or BMP, um, to manage stormwater on their property. Living shoreline installations are eligible for reimbursement given that the projects meet required specifications and the reimbursement application is approved. For this current fiscal year, the living shoreline reimbursement rate is 75% of your total cost up to $15,000. So um, some considerations if you are thinking about applying um, for a living shoreline reimbursement. Um, there is a 10 year maintenance lifespan for all living shorelines installed through the VCAP program. So that means that after your application is approved and you've installed your shoreline, you are required to maintain it for 10 years. Um, eligible shorelines must not exceed a fetch distance of one and a half miles in any direction. 
and any property with new construction uh, must wait for three years after construction is complete to apply. Um, so there are a lot more program requirements and considerations that we just don't have time to get into tonight. Um, but if you are interested in learning more about BCAP, you can um, contact your local soil and water conservation district. Um, in case you're not sure which district serves your locality, on the next slide, um, you'll see a map of conservation districts in the Lower James Watershed and which localities they serve. Um, you'll notice that there are several localities in the Lower James Watershed that are not included in a district service area. And unfortunately, at this time, um, residents of those localities are unable to access VCAP funding. Um, so I will be happy to answer any questions in the uh, discussion period after the presentations are over, but for now I will hand things off to Rachel Peabody with the Elizabeth River Project. Hi, um, I'm Rachel Peabody. I'm the Assistant Director of Restoration at the Elizabeth River Project. And um, we are a nonprofit organization based out of Norfolk, um, but our focus is to gather um, citizens, businesses, um, schools, scientists, government organizations um, together to restore the Elizabeth River by through water quality and um, habitat restoration. One of the ways that we do that is our River Star Homes program. <clears throat> and this is for private property owners. They sign up for a River Star home um, by pledging to do some simple things like um, not putting grease down their sink, um, uh, not feeding geese, uh, very basic things. And when they sign up for the program, they are eligible for our cost share for living shorelines. We also cost share lots of other water quality projects like rain gardens, buffer restoration, living shorelines, all of these individually. So we can, if a homeowner wants us to, only write the check for their for our portion of the living shoreline. We're happy to do that with an invoice. But we can also um, get more into the weeds. So if there's a homeowner who doesn't want to design, doesn't want to hire contractors, doesn't want to do the permitting, we can do all of those things for them plus cost share. We will cost share up to $4,000, um, but generally we have additional funds through other grants to offer more uh, money for those projects that need them. So this would be any, this uh, who qualifies as any private property that's within the Elizabeth River watershed. Um, so that covers Chesapeake, Norfolk, um, Portsmouth, and a little bit of Virginia Beach. And please feel free, if you're interested, to contact me by email or Barbara Gavin, who uh, manages the River Star Homes program. And we can start with a site visit. And basically, we just ask what it is that, that you need, and we try and fulfill those needs any way we can. And so just for a quick project, another um, before and after similar to Tom Ivey's. So this was one of our first living shorelines um, in the Lafayette River. And as you can see here, they just had lost all vegetation and we call the rubble there Norfolk rubble, um, which is just general things people throw along the shoreline to try and prevent uh, erosion. So we removed that put in some sand and some coir logs, and there it is um, three years later. And so um, for the final person chatting, it's gonna be Ryan from the James River Association, who's gonna talk about his program. Hi all, if you're just jumping on, my name is Ryan Walsh. I'm the Lower James Restoration Coordinator for the James River Association. Uh, JRA is very excited to announce that we are just about to launch um, our own Living Shoreline Cost Share Program. So uh, we are mainly focused on the Lower James watershed uh, in the west from Charles City County in the north and Prince George County in the south, all the way to the mouth of the river in Hampton. Uh, we will design projects for you. Uh, we will conduct uh, free site visits and we can even uh, provide qualified contractors. We'll pay 50% uh, of total project cost and if you have any questions, you can send me an email at rwalsh at thejamesriver.org. And I would just really like to reiterate, you don't have to live directly on the main stem of the James River. You can certainly live in any of the tidal creeks or tributaries or anywhere uh, indicated in this map. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Ryan. Um, 
And thank you to all of our speakers. And um, I do want to mention something that uh, Shireen pointed out in the in the chat box that we um, that I, I forgot to mention. Uh, both, I believe, both of the projects that we did, we showed the videos of, were installed by um, Jim Cahoon with Bay Environmental. Is that right, Rachel? That the Elizabeth River project project was also Bay Environmental. Yes, that was Bay Environmental. Okay. Um, and you know, did a fantastic job on that. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, in, a, in a minute, we're going to open up the floor to questions. But before we do, Amber, can you queue up our next poll? All right. So we're asking, you know, if you think that one of these programs could make a difference for you to get started on a living shoreline project. And while folks are answering, well, I forgot to thank the Virginia Environmental Endowment. Uh, they provided the funding so we could start this cost share program. Okay. Yep, it looks like uh, it looks like folks are, you know, definitely interested in, uh, you know, potentially taking that next step to look into installing a living shoreline. So we'll have to keep an eye on our email inboxes. Uh, <laughs> so I uh, let's see here. So can you go to the next slide, Amber? So I have up here the contact information for all of our speakers, um, which I'll also be sending out to you guys. But uh, I want to open the floor to questions. All of our speakers have agreed to stay on the line until seven, so for another half hour. Um, so we can, you know, take a look at the chat box, see if there's any questions um, from there. Karen, did any pop out to you in the chat box? You want to take a look at? Uh, let me go back up. Um, from a funding perspective, there was a question at the bottom about what about a condo association with more shoreline? Do they get a higher reimbursement? And I can't answer that question. I think that question was during the VCAP uh, presentation. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll jump in into that and then. Um, so condo associations and HOAs can apply for VCAP um, as a landowner. Um, they are not necessarily eligible to receive um, more reimbursements though. So um, as of this year, there is a cap on reimbursements per participant. Um, the VCAP program is extremely popular across the state and funding is limited. So um, in an effort to encourage uh, more folks to get involved, there are funding caps in place. Um, so a condo association would not be eligible to receive uh, more than that $15,000 cap. I'd add that I do know on the Northern Neck, at least one HOA has gotten a VCAP uh, project funded. And I do know a condo association on the Northern Neck has also gotten a VCAP project funded. I will say our, the James River program, I don't have it in front of me, Emily correct, or Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, ours does have a higher cap because um, we kind of created it to fill those niches that other programs couldn't. I believe it's 50,000 is the cap. Is that right, Emily? I'm having a moment. Yes, of... that's correct. Yeah. So that's where we're trying to work together with partners if to make sure that we find the best fit for you all um, in your circumstance. I see a, I see a raised hand from Thomas. The priest's hand has been there for a while. I think he might have already asked his question. Is he still with us? There's so many participants. I can't see everybody. <laughs> there was an interesting comment in the chat box about, um, interestingly, there's a shoreline restoration project happening at this moment across the river from me at this moment. So that's exciting. That was me. I'm sorry. I, I live on the Lafayette and it's behind the Lindenwood Elementary School. So it's been really great to see. I see a, a question in the chat box about um, another one about oyster castles. It says, 
What's the benefit of oyster structures as opposed to riprap? Would mussels and other critters establish on riprap as well? So riprap is that, um, are the large rocks that people use to stabilize. Yeah, riprap is the gray stone that is used to make sills and revetments placed against the bank. And we've done some studies at VIMS to count the number of animals that are actually growing on the rocks. Um, and we found some significant differences um, between one side of a, a rock revetment or sill on the main river side versus the other side. But the, the main um, advantage of the oyster castles and other smaller structures is that they are purposefully designed to allow for the growth of uh, attachment organisms. The, they're, the, they're proprietary materials, the concrete sometimes has shell in it. Um, and the, the surfaces, how do I say this, are not as slippery and are, are designed to have um, interstitial spaces and crevices for the growth of more reef organisms. So that's one advantage. The other advantage and the reason why the popularity of using small reef units like oyster castles has grown in popularity is the cost factor um, and the ability to move the material to the shoreline. So some of the sill projects require relatively large rocks, which requires heavy equipment and dump trucks to move the material from the quarries. So it, it can be uh, costly. So if you're able to use a, um, a bucket brigade, if you will, of volunteers to move units of oyster castles or shell bags or other small units that a person can pick up, you can deploy and install a project like that for less money. And they tend to be more effective on the, you know, the lower energy shoreline sites where you don't need a rock structure, but you need a little bit more than just a marsh can provide. So there, there's sort of a, a range of projects where the wave energy isn't great enough to justify the expense of a sill, but it's not, an, you know, there's just too much wave energy for a marsh to persist. So those are some of the advantages of oyster reef structures over rock. Um, I've seen a couple questions that are asking specifically about steep banks. Um, this one says, what would you suggest for steep banks along a river or a pond? Often trees are falling along the banks and the bank is unstable. So one approach I didn't have time to really get into is something called bank grading, where you actually change the slope of that high bluff or high bank if you can. Now this can be um, a large land disturbance project. And if it's very unstable and the trees are already falling down and it's sparsely vegetated, those are the best sites to address with bank grading. And you, you basically take equipment and you create a, a flatter slope that will grow vegetation better. And then it's either replanted or you use a combination of planting and natural regeneration of vegetation to stabilize the slope over the long time. But that's one of the first approaches to try to address high eroding banks is to see if you have room to grade them back. And the, the limitation there is if you have a house or a road or a pool or a septic system or a well or other infrastructure near the top of the bank, you might not have space for that. Um, you can get permission to push the material into the water but that's when you start to impact the aquatic resources. And so the, the design of that approach is, is not as easy to accomplish. And I'm, I'm gonna let Aaron weigh in on this as well, if he has any comment from C's perspective about high banks. Yeah, I mean, you said it right. Uh, the, the, the other factor that people gotta look at is if they have infrastructure there, if their house is too close where they can't grade it back, or if their septic system is right there where they can't grade it back, or there's um, large trees that they really want to preserve. Um, oftentimes bank grading will have to deal with trees that are still standing even to get that grant bank graded back properly. And so there's a lot of factors that play for an individual site. From a living shoreline perspective, the only other really choice you have is to, if you have a shallow, relatively flat slope near shore area and intertidal zone, that you can install a marsh in front of the toe of the bank, you will at least reduce wave action striking the toe of that bank that's contributing to the erosion from the top to the bottom of that bank. 
Um, so absent bank grading, trying to do a marsh sill or um, a wide marsh at the toe would be the next approach to consider if, if it's suitable or not. I think we have a follow-up question about the steep banks asking about planting bald cypress. You know, that uh, I was with uh, some James River staff a couple years ago. We took a boat trip down the James looking at the James River National Wildlife Refuge shoreline. And, you know, that's it's the natural system there is bald cypress and uh, Wildlife Refuge staff asked similar questions if if you can use planted bald cypress as part of your shoreline stabilization. And, uh, you know, I think the, sh the, the short answer is yes. But again, will that tree um, grow fast enough for you to halt your shoreline uh, erosion issue to combat the waves that are coming in and your specific situation? Again, it, Aaron's right. It depends on what's causing the erosion at that location. And if the shoreline is already dominated by a cypress swamp, then that is um, a, a good choice. But you have to address where, what's the forces of the water underneath the trees? And can you also um, do something underneath the trees to reduce either currents, tidal, strong tidal currents, or the rise and fall of the tides or even waves and boat wakes. Sometimes that's where boat wakes can be a problem on some of these narrower waterways where motorized boats are coming and going and they are sending boat wakes that strike the shoreline often. And so dealing with that type of um, wave energy might not be possible with planting trees. But, um, and the other problem with cypress, they're very slow growing. And so that's another another challenge with it. But there, cypress are excellent trees to plant along the shoreline. Uh, we, we've grown them successfully at BIMS um, um, and, they, and they don't have to be in the water. They, they'll grow on the upland area as well, quite well. And they're very uh, beautiful trees, if you ask me. Um, I saw a question, this was a little while ago, but it's asking how necessary are the netting fence and string arrangement to inhibit birds from eating the new grasses? Very necessary. <laughs> and I Kennedy think Jim has joined us now as well. Hi, Jim. How are you? So um, goose predation fencing is, has become, unfortunately, fairly critical anywhere pretty much east of uh, the fall line in Richmond. Um, Canada geese in particular are, have become non-migratory. And uh, when you plant um, things like Spartina alterniflora, it's like ringing a dinner bell. Um, the, the buffet has been laid. So um, we, we use it, we have to use it on every project. Um, in Southeastern Virginia, uh, several of the localities and uh, VMRC as started require, actually requiring it as a permit requirement for most projects that you have to have some type of um, predation uh, fencing. You know, once we get good growth, usually one um, growing season, we're able to remove that fencing. Um, and um, it, it, if you don't put it out, you're, you are going to lose plants. I, I think the geese have scouts now that look for projects. Um, they may even be trolling the um, VMRC website for permit applications looking for sites. So, <laughs> We got a good question um, asking about uh, erosion due to boat wakes. So if a bank is receiving a lot of wave action due to boating, is there a need for a no wake zone along the eroding bank? And this is, I, I know this, this question also came to me in an email asking about um, any sort of uh, prohibitions on, dry, on creating large wakes along um, shorelines. I can answer. Go, Go ahead, ahead Rachel, good, because I'm not familiar with that. Go ahead. Um, so yeah, I mean, slowing boats down can help. Uh, generally, we see the erosion is the most when they're when they start their slowdown and when they start their speeding up. Um, also, when boats are backing in and out of their boat lifts, 
Um, in order to get authorization for an actual um, no wake zone, the locality has to request that through the Department of Game and Landland Fisheries. So it's a little bit of a tough process. So you would have to ask your locality through their council and then their council would have to go to DGIF to get it approved. So if, and if anyone has a question they just want to ask out loud, feel free to unmute and ask that way as well. I see a question <laughs> that uh, Shireen has, has given a pretty good answer, but it, it's about, about large wave energy sites. And the question was about the Northern Neck and um, Chesapeake Bay, but if you look at the Chesapeake Bay and, and even along the James River where the wave energy is, is significant, yeah, a living shoreline can be appropriate, but it's a different kind of living shoreline. So if you have um, breakwaters can be placed with a uh, larger quarry stone offshore in, in, in a correct alignment and you can build a crescent beach that you can um, stabilize with dune and um, other, other grass species, then that that's a living shoreline as well. And so um, if everyone remembers from the beginning of the presentation where um, Karen had a uh, showed a spectrum of possible options. So living shorelines by themselves are, is a huge variety of options. And there are things that can be done on, on large wave energy sites, but it, it becomes a bigger project. And the key there is that you're mimicking the habitat that's dominant at that location. And on along the northern neck bay facing shorelines, that tends to be a beach, a sandy beach. So the living shoreline concept is to create a, a wide protective beach. And in order to do that, you use a system called an offshore breakwater system, which uses larger rocks. Um, like It's like a sill, but they're just larger and they're placed a little bit more strategically. And they're very effective. As Shereen noted in the chat box, they've been used very effectively all along the James at different locations and also in other parts of coastal Virginia. I, had, I saw a question earlier. It's tying back to the steep bank question, but it was asking specifically if um, this is someone who's got a, a steep bank on the Nansmond and it's, uh, there's a 15 foot difference over a course of approximately six feet. So I guess it drops 15 feet in that distance. Um, so it's asking if we have any information on a project that has a similar situation. Uh, kind of 15 foot type bank. So if you're referring to bank height, like the height of the bank is 15 feet from like if you're standing down on the shoreline and you're looking up and the top of the bank is about 15 feet above you that seems like it might be a candidate site for bank grading, depending on how um, developed the upland area is in the shoreline, whether you have sufficient space. So I encourage you, if you're on the Nansamen, um, this puts you in the area where you can um, contact any of the resources you've just learned about and the technical experts like Aaron and have somebody come help you do an evaluation and look at the different alternatives that might be feasible for that location. If, if you're there, Joshua, and you'd like to clarify what you mean by um, your description, you're certainly welcome to. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, yeah, it's a 15-foot well, height from the water uh, level, and uh, it's about 16 or 6 feet from when it's uh, high tide to the top of that bank. Um, we did have seas come out uh, a while back in the beginning of this year, and okay. they let us know that uh, a lot of the – overhanging trees should be removed um, so that it doesn't weigh down that bank. Um, and uh, I'm just trying to figure out what to do to fix that bank. That's uh, cutting down the trees kind of like prevented it from pulling a chunk out of my bank, but I just want to know what's the best option that's, you know, tried and proven uh, that's affordable. <laughs> Where is the erosion occurring on your bank? Is it um, like I described from the top to the bottom or just mostly the top or the bottom or? The uh, top to bottom, ma'am. So it's actively eroding on the entire bank phase. Yes. And if there's overhanging trees, is if, if it's a, uh, what direction does the shoreline face? 
it's uh, a good question. If it's a north facing shoreline, that means there's a lot of shade cast onto that bank that's preventing other vegetation from taking hold like grasses. But it's also if it's actively moving soil, it's hard for seeds to germinate and take root to help stop that erosion process. So the, really the answer is to try to get a more gradual slope somehow. And, okay. and also providing protection at the toe to reduce the wave, the amount of waves that are striking the base of the bank. And also look at the runoff patterns. Or do you have any stormwater runoff coming from your house and driveway or sidewalks or decks that are maybe contributing to the instability of your bank? I don't believe I have any stormwater runoff. Uh, I think it's just normal uh, weather patterns. And, and just space, uh, got soil, right? Yeah, I got uh, at some points, um, actually it was just on the water today, and a portion of the soil that was eaten out from underneath, and it was probably about uh, like four, three or four feet underneath the slope, that whole portion has fallen down. Uh, and there's areas that go back six feet. So it's been eaten out pretty, pretty well by all the wave action that's been going up and down the bank or down the river. Hopefully I can fix that soon. Well, if he's on the Nanseman, Ryan, doesn't that make him qualified for your program? It certainly does, yep. I suggest, if I were you, Joshua, I'd be sending an email to Ryan right now. <laughs> and VCAP, they, they, could, um, they could stack some funding at that point. Uh, for VCAP, um, I just bought this house in April and it's a new build. Um, so VCAP, I believe you said it's a three year wait uh, before you can even apply. Um, that's correct. When was the home built? Uh, it was April this year. Okay. So there is, um, VCAP is meant to be a retrofit program. So that is why that three year um, limit is in place. I see. Is there any sort of waivers um, concerning that or no? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Josh, if you'd like to send me an email, uh, get right ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. I'll have to wait for the uh, contact information when the uh, email after this. We're getting quite a few questions about vegetation. So questions about, you know, if a tree is leaning over the water, should, should it be cut? Or are roots helping hold the soil in place? There's a question about fast growing plants or vines that uh, could help stabilize steep banks without resloping. So the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act, a state law, pretty uh, important state law passed many years ago here in Virginia, um, really designed to help protect our riparian areas um, all along our waterways. And some of you may be familiar with the term RPA or resource protection area or 100 foot buffer. Um, some of those terms are all thrown around uh, and, and kind of mean the same thing for this discussion. And so, you know, the purposes of the, of the Ches Bay Prevent, uh, Act is to protect the riparian area or protect the vegetation that, that's there. And um, there are um, uh, exemptions might be the wrong word, but there are exemptions for certain situations where vegetation can be removed if, uh, if there's a justifiable need for it. Um, the, the, the act allows for homeowners to have uh, views of their waterway. The, the Ches Bay Act allows um, homeowners to have, you know, pathways down to their docks to get to their boat. And then there's also a discussion in the, the act about shoreline erosion. And so, yeah, if there are, um, you know, the classic example would be a large, significantly large dead tree that's undercut with all the roots exposed that's uh, hanging off of your 15 foot bank and, and when the next storm comes is gonna pull a big chunk out. Yeah, that tree can be uh, removed. And even if the tree's alive, it's, it's possible that it can be removed, but you shouldn't just go out there and cut it down or get a contractor to cut it down for yourself. You need to talk to your locality and tell them that that's what's occurring. Um, that uh, you think you need to take a tree down because it's contributing to a shoreline erosion issue and and uh, then they would need to talk to you and, and, and uh, talk to you about possible mitigation for taking that tree out. But 
in, in theory, you can take a, a, a tree out that is oh. uh, contributing or uh, could contribute to a large erosion situation. And to answer the question about fast growing plants or vines to stabilize steep banks without resloping, do not plant kudzu. That's, that's just one. I've seen it growing on some of our James River shorelines. It's already, and it, it's very shallow rooted and it really doesn't solve the erosion problem for some of our high sandy banks. Um, so back best, to deep rooted grasses are the best things to plant. But again, you have to address if there's erosion occurring, uh, if, how slippery is that slope and how much is the sediment moving? I want to go back to Josh's example there a minute ago. I think that I think that was my colleague that went to that site, Mike Van Lanningham. And from what he told me, yeah, I mean, uh, um, the other issue was that that new house was, you know, fairly close uh, to the waterway. Um, and so there may be infrastructure and there may not be a situation where you could grade the bank back. I think if I remember, it was also a narrower lot. So again, bank grading may not be too feasible. And so in that situation, um, you know, you may have to look at other options besides living shorelines. And that's, that, that, that really depends on a site specific evaluation um, that any of any of us on this uh, webcast can come out to your property and talk to you about. I have a question that I should know the answer to but I don't know the answer to it. Um, like upriver, I'm more familiar with freshwater life. Um, and there's things like we can plant live stakes of different species like black willow and things right into those eroding banks. Are there similar shrub or tree species that can tolerate more salt water? Or is there like a range where those end? Like, cause we've got them um, in some tidal portions around um, Richmond. Um, but I don't know how far those go or if there's other species similar. I can address that. And the answer is Thanks. no, unfortunately. In fact, we use woody vegetation, the, the, the signature and remote imagery as a signal of where the tidal waters stop and non-tidal waters and wetlands. Okay, begin. thank you. Um, there, there are very few. Uh, bald cypress is an exception. Bald, there has a, some tolerance to some very, very low levels of salinity. Um, the only approach that's been used that I'm aware of are large logs, sort of arraying and trying to anchor. That's the challenge. And I've, I've thrown some engineers the challenge. If you figure out how to anchor large woody debris, and there's some shorelines like in the Prince George County area um, where it's, there's a lot of already a lot of fallen debris along the shoreline. If we could figure out a way to strategically array those large logs to break up wave and tidal currents, that, that might be a, a good living shoreline approach because it provides habitat. It's not a green plant, but it's still using the same concept of the habitat that's already natural there, but arranging it strategically to reduce forces causing erosion. Mm -hmm. I'm scrolling back up through our chat box. Yeah, me too. There's it's a long chat box, isn't it? Yeah, that's great. Save it again. And if I missed your question, feel free to speak up. Yeah, I'm avoiding the groundhog one on purpose. <laughs> yeah, we might have mangroves in the James River, but I think the shoreline would be much further inland from where it is right now. Yeah, the, the, the northern limit of mangroves hasn't quite reached Virginia yet, but... Uh, Climate change yeah, might right. climate change, change, affect yeah. that, but currently the, the, the northern limit of mangroves is around Daytona Beach, Florida. The project you're working on, right, the one on the Appomattox or in mm -hmm. the Appomattox Regional Park, that's kind of a weird, doesn't that have some shrubby material, like a shrubby marsh? And it's fresh water. Um, yeah, yeah, it's fresh water, but tidal. Tidal fresh water. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess for that. 
Ryan? Go right ahead. Hey, so um, there we're actually mimicking adjacent marshes. Um, so there, there are pocket marshes there in Appomattox River Regional Park, and we're going to kind of mimic those. Primarily, those are herbaceous species like uh, duck potato, and um, so we've got Beltandra and Sagittaria and some of the other uh, t freshwater tidal species that we're targeting there. Um, but uh, uh, as you move, uh, you know, as you move up the James, James, you get into that sort of uh, limited tidal, um, limited salt. Um, so we might be at zero to a 10 parts per thousand uh, salinity. And that's where we look at some of those freshwater tidal marshes that you see sometimes they're wind, more wind tidal. Um, but um, you still, there's still a vast palette of species that we can potentially use for living shorelines as you move into the non saline environment. Um, you know, so much focus has been put on saline environment, Spartina alternate flora type projects. Um, but as we move up there, there's a number of species that we can still use to stabilize shorelines. Or that will appear over time naturally from the local seed bank. Correct. And, and that's going to be a really good demonstration site to showcase those freshwater tidal living shoreline examples in the James. I mean, there's examples in the Potomac, there's examples in the York, but that'll, that'll be a great one um, if anybody wants to go to that, uh, that park and take a look. And That's the project at Chickahominy River Park will have a mixture of freshwater and saltwater species because it's that's where it's located. It's got a little bit of both. So it'll be interesting to track that one as well. Yeah, I'm seeing a question, another question about bald cypress. Um, asking, I, I see that Shireen just answered it, but asking about how well the seedlings tolerate being submerged um, but it appears this question's talking about bald cypress in, in Norfolk, where it's pretty salty. Or was that in the reservoir? Um, there was a question earlier about that's, erosion along a reservoir. And I don't know if that's the same person or not. I think it is. And so my, my response to that would be, it depends on how long the, the seedlings got started before the water levels rose, because bald cypress will adapt to being submerged uh, by using different root structures and putting up the cypress knees and things to, to get oxygen. So it, if they were already fairly well established before the city raised the water level, they, they might be fine. Um, I, I guess it depends on how much stress they're experiencing as Shireen says. That, that's a good point. Um, they actually, you know, uh, uh, ball cypress will tolerate some saline uh, environment. We used for the riparian buffer at uh, Collie Bay in Norfolk, we installed uh, a number of bald cypress. However, they aren't regularly inundated. They're uh, sort of that riparian buffer. They just happen to be a little wetter, um, but they will tolerate that um, uh, moderate, m minimal to moderate um, saline environment. I just wanted to add something about uh, wetland trees, for instance, like the bald cypress that will grow in a very uh, low oxygen environment underwater when they send up the knees. They'll also grow in a compacted soil environment because it's also low oxygen. But um, it depends on how the plant started out. Like if they it was started out growing in soil in a nursery um, or in a, you know, an environment that wasn't submerged. It, it depends on what, sometimes the plants won't adapt to the new conditions. So it just depends. <laughs> she says she started them in pots. So um, if they weren't if the pots weren't in really uh, like out in the rain and stayed wet and saturated most of the time, um, 
then they might have been stressed. But if they were saturated and wet and then put into the water, then maybe they'll be fine. So hopefully you'll have some survivors there, Heidi. All right. Well, um, it's actually just turned seven. I didn't didn't realize the time passed that fast. Um, and I'm not seeing any more questions. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And if more questions, you know, pop up, feel free to reach out to uh, to one of the experts that uh, presented tonight. Because we're always happy to try and help. <laughs>